So we saw in previous lectures that monetary policy was a great um, policy for stabilization. So we saw that if you have fluctuations in unemployment and these fluctuations are inefficient so that your unemployment rate departs from the efficient unemployment rate, then you could use monetary policy. You could adjust the interest rate to uh, control aggregate demand and uh, bring back the unemployment rate to its efficient level. And we derive a formula as well that tells you by how much you should uh, adjust interest rates when you know the unemployment gap and when you know the monetary multipliers, the effect of interest rate on unemployment. Um, so now we're going to move to a different policy, which is fiscal policy. Uh, and we're going to derive a sufficient statistic formula for the optimal size of a stimulus package. Um, so the departure from government spending from its, uh, from its usual level. Uh, and you know this package actually can be positive. Uh, if you want to boost the economy, it could also be you know, negative if you want to cool down the economy. So we'll think about that. Um, but before we do that, a natural question is, uh, when is it that we should use fiscal uh, policy for stabilization? And that's what I want to talk uh, about here. So when should we use fiscal policy for stabilization? And um, I guess there are two parts to this question. So the first question is, we saw that monetary policy was effective at, you know, was able to stabilize the economy. In fact, we saw that it was optimal for monetary policy to always keep the unemployment rate at its efficient level. And so, you know, if you can do that, your economy is always at its efficient level and there is really nothing else to do for fiscal policy, you know. So, uh, so you know, given how the type of frameworks, like Vixelian frameworks that we are uh, thinking about, uh, given how powerful monetary policy is, given that it can keep the economy at its efficient level, like why is it that we should use fiscal policy at all to stabilize the economy? Why not just use monetary policy? Uh, and the reason is that there are setups in which monetary policy is actually important and you cannot use it to stabilize the economy. And so in a world like this, although it's true that monetary policy is a great policy for stabilization, um, there are setups in which you cannot use it. And then when you cannot use it, then you have to move to uh, fiscal policy. Um, so fiscal policy is helpful um, to stabilize the economy when monetary policy is uh, important. And so what are setups in which monetary policy is important and you cannot use it? Um, well, so one setup that we've talked about, of course, is a zero lower bound on nominal interest rate. So nominal interest rates, they cannot go to a negative, they cannot be negative. We know the argument for that, that if you had negative interest rates on bonds, then people would move all their money out of bonds and they would just store their money, their wealth with just money. Money pays a zero interest rate and so it would be strictly dominating bonds and then, you know, there would be no demand for bonds at all. And so, so you know, the lowest amount that bonds can pay is zero in, in nominal terms. Now, of course, in practice, we see in the real world, for instance, in Switzerland, we saw that nominal interest rates can go a little negative because, of course, it's costly to move all your wealth out of bonds and put it in money. And so, in practice, nominal interest rate can go a little negative. It will maybe half a percentage point, maybe three quarters of a percentage point, or maybe one percentage point. Um, but, you know, it uh, at least it's, it appears that central banks, that, you know, they realize that they cannot go uh, much lower than that. So, uh, you know, the zero lower bound, you know, even if it's not exactly zero, there is a lower bound on nominal uh, interest rates. And 
nominal interest rate cannot go below that. And so once you reach that lower bound, monetary policy cannot stabilize the economy further. Um, and so, uh, so once you reach uh, the zero lower bound, then it's helpful to have fiscal policy to try to stabilize the economy. There's another setup in which uh, monetary policy actually, in fact, government do not have access to monetary policy, but they have access to fiscal policy and therefore they can use it to stabilize the economy. Um, and this is when governments are part of a monetary union. So when monetary policy is decided at a higher level than the government we're thinking about, so that the government, in fact, cannot choose monetary policy, but they can choose fiscal policy. So monetary, uh, so the LB here is that uh, here interest rates cannot be reduced further. And so here we have monetary union. Here is that the government uh, does not control monetary policy and interest rates. Right. Or oh, something I should have said, so zero lower bound, you know, of course, how common it is. Well, we know this is something that happens. Uh, so we know it happened during, uh, of course, the Great Depression. Uh, but in the US, but it also happened again during the Great Recession. Uh, and basically the decade, uh, the decade after that. So this is something that's uh, quite common when you have uh, turbulent economic times. So monetary unions. So these are situations when the government actually does not control monetary policy or interest rate, but uh, generally uh, it controls fiscal policy. So in a world like that, you don't have a monetary policy tool, but you do have access to fiscal policy, and therefore you can use fiscal policy for stabilization. So here, what is it that I'm thinking about when I talk about monetary union? So one, you can think, for instance, of the euro area. So all the countries that are uh, in the euro area. If you're a country that's part of the euro area, your monetary policy is determined by the European Central Bank. Um, so you know, you do not have, a, you know, back in the days, each European country had its own central bank that would control monetary policy. But now that they are in the euro bloc, uh, monetary policy is determined at a higher level by the European Central Bank, um, and it's not determined by individual countries. Uh, and so if you're an individual country, like say, you know, like your Greece, uh, during the, you know, like in 2000, in the 2010s, um, your economy is hit particularly badly by the Great Recession, but you do not have your own monetary policy. Um, you don't have control of that. That's determined centrally by the European Central, by the European Central Bank, but you have access to your own fiscal policy. Um, you can do government spending, you can adjust uh, taxes. Uh, and so in a world like this, you can use your own fiscal policy to stabilize the economy. Uh, in fact, during the Great Recession, a lot of individual countries in the south of Europe, Greece, Spain, um, Portugal, they were forced to use their fiscal policy to stabilize their economy. So the IMF, for instance, forced them to implement austerity. Now, that was a big mistake, of course, um, because austerity did not work and, in fact, seemed to have made things worse. Um, but, you know, instead, they should probably have... Um, try to spend more um, to boost their economy at that time. But nevertheless, this, this goes to show that um, countries had access to some fiscal policy that they could use for their own, to tackle their own situation, but they did not have access to monetary policy. Um, so the euro area is one example. Um, but if you think about states in the US, it's exactly the same. If you're a state in the US, you do not have access to monetary policy. That's determined by the uh, Federal Reserve. Um, but you do have your own fiscal policy. Um, states are able to determine how much they want to spend at, uh, at the state level. Um, there are also state level taxes that they can use to fund their spending. They can also issue uh, bonds um, if they want to. Um, so if you're a state and you're hit by you know, like a business, like a business cycle or your situation is different from the aggregate condition, 
monetary policy doesn't really, you know, the Fed doesn't do enough because the recession in your state is worse than in the aggregate, then you can use fiscal policy to try to alleviate the situation. So that would be another example. If you're a state, you can also use fiscal policy, in a, um, but you, although you do not control uh, monetary policy. So in all these situations, um, either when monetary policy is important or you do not control monetary policy, then fiscal policy is a nice instrument that you can use to stabilize the economy. So a natural question, if fiscal policy can be used for stabilization, is why is it that we don't use fiscal policy first before monetary policy? Um, why does fiscal policy come second in this discussion? And here, I think there are two reasons. So one, on the theory side, um, monetary policy, you know, it acts in, in, the, in the type of Vixelian uh, framework that we've looked at. It acts by changing interest rate. That creates no distortion at all. The interest rate is going to just affect the aggregate demand, but there are no other uh, effects. And so you can just bring your aggregate demand and get exactly your efficient allocation. Um, so that's a great policy, it creates no extra distortion. Fiscal, poli fiscal policy, as we will see, um, creates some distortion because when the government decides to spend more to provide, you know, here what the government does is, uh, you know, spend more, so provide more public good because that's what the government does is to provide um, public goods. So you're going to distort the provision of good in the economy away from private goods and toward public goods. And of course, public good can substitute uh, for private goods. So, you know, you can have a private school, but instead you can have a public school that provided, uh, you know, you can have a private hospital that can be replaced by a public hospital. So there is some substitution, of course, but they do not substitute perfectly public good for private goods. They are private goods that, you know, the government doesn't know how to provide, it's not able to provide. These are just kind of different goods in any way. Um, and so the more the government provides, you know, the more the share of public good in the economy, and that's a share that, uh, and it means also the smaller the share of private good in the economy. So you create that distortion when the government decides to um, spend more. When the government spends less, it's the same. You tend to have then more private good in your economy than uh, public good, and that can also be costly and because private goods are not able to replace a uh, substitute for public goods perfectly. Uh, but in any case, the, the way the government is able to stabilize the economy is by spending, by providing more or less public good, and that's going to create some distortion. So it's a policy that's not um, as clean, if you want, as monetary policy. It creates some distortion, and therefore, as we will see, it's not optimal actually to reach the efficient allocation because of this distortion. So fiscal policy will um, bring the economy closer to the efficient allocation, but not all the way to the efficient allocation because of this distortion. Um, and so you cannot do as well as with monetary policy when you use fiscal policy. What's better is to perfectly stabilize the economy with monetary policy and then provide the amount of public goods that you would want based on, uh, you know, based on a Samuelson type uh, rule. Uh, that's what's best. But now if you don't have monetary policy, what you'll do is that you'll distort your Samuelson type rule to stabilize the economy. But that's not as good as uh, going with monetary policy first. So that's the reason. Um, so because of distortions in the uh, provision of public goods, basically distortions in the basket of goods consumed by consumers, Fiscal policy is not as appropriate for stabilization. And the way we will see that in, in, this, uh, in this section of the course is that uh, it's not optimal to um, 
stabilize the economy perfectly with fiscal policy. So you know, there will always be, you know, we are not gonna, we are, you know, we cannot, uh, the efficient allocation cannot be achieved with fiscal policy. Uh, with fiscal policy alone. So we'll see that we can improve what's going on and we can get closer to uh, say U star, but uh, we are not going to get all the way to U star. And these are because of the distortion uh, that fiscal policy creates. Um, another thing that's um, more of a political economy consideration is that there are institutions to constantly adjust uh, monetary policy. And this is in the US and the Federal Reserve. These are central banks in general. And central banks are really designed to be independent and constantly monitor the economy and be able to quickly respond to business cycle fluctuations. Whereas fiscal policy is determined in the US by Congress, but in general in other countries by parliament. And these are very slow institution with a lot of you know, political um, you know, considerations that make it hard for uh, the, you know, the legislative uh, branch to act quickly and uh, stabilize the economy when you have uh, when you have business cycle. And so, you know, it, it will be hard for fiscal policy to, you know, to be constantly adjusted to respond to business cycle, at least given current political institution, because um, the legislative branch is not really designed for that, whereas Central banks are exactly designed for, uh, you know, for stabilization. Central banks are institutions designed for stabilization. You know, unlike uh, parliaments. or the legislative branch. So for this reason, one that's kind of more, this is more of a political economy consideration. And the other one is a theoretical consideration. The, the distortions are created. Um, monetary policy is going, you know, it makes sense to look at monetary policy first uh, when thinking about, uh, about stabilization. Anyway, but because monetary policy is not uh, always effective, now we're going to turn uh, to fiscal policy and see how we should design it when you have business cycle fluctuations. 